free. Mr. Bejeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see all of you again. Um, we are, have the pleasure of having Arthur Bergeron back to join us for another one of his legal clinic series. The, today, we're going to be talking about what will happen to your body after you, you, you die. And we're going to do the soul one as a sequel. That's <laughs> be and we also have Michael Hoyt from our uh, from Chapman, Cole, and Gleason. That's going to be also taking part in the presentation. So without any further ado, welcome and welcome Arthur and welcome Michael. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you again, Joyce, for inviting us back. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I just met Michael Hoyt. We were just talking about uh, kind of all the things we're going to talk about. Um, as you know, usually when I do these presentations, I try to go all the way through the presentation and have the folks that are my guests talk and then we have questions at the end, but that's not how we want to do this one. We're really going to do this by section because I have found in my years of practice that there are a jillion questions regarding this topic and they're all like little questions. So we're going to kind of talk about a whole bunch of things uh, and I've asked Mike to, to be kind of talking. We're going to be kind of interacting a lot here. So we'll just take questions as we go along. So um, we better turn this on. Here we go. Yes. So you know my friends, Frank and Mary, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Remember their goal is to live until they die, live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. So we're gonna find out actually whether he can really do that. I've been using this slide for years. Um, and you know, usually we talk about Frank and Mary first and we talk about, oh my God, Frank has died. And so now what happens to Mary? Well, instead today, we're gonna talk about Frank. So Frank has died. And the question is, so kind of what happens next? And there are a whole set of questions about that. Um, first of all, when you are dead, uh, who controls your remains? Now, interestingly, I think this one, this one really is kind of a legal question. And interestingly, until two or three years ago, there was no statute on this. There was nothing that actually said who controlled your remains. There was case law, and the case law said that if you died, um, your, th that, that your, your spouse, if you have a spouse, was in control of your remains, and that if your spouse wasn't there, then it was your children, but it wasn't like in any particular order, right? right. So did, did you ever have a case where the kids disagreed regarding what happened? Yes. Well, you would. You would. <laughs> And would you like flip a coin? Well, you know, I'll try and get everybody to come to a compromise and get on the same page, if you will. So. It's really important to get everybody on the same page because there wasn't any way to figure it out, right? Um, finally, that just changed. So you should just be aware of that. Finally, by statute, when Massachusetts adopted something called the Uniform Probate Code a few years ago, uh, which was a kind of a, 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 a there was a, a code that has been developed and adopted by a number of states, one of the provisions actually deals and says that the person who is named as your personal representative, they used to be called executors or executrixes, in your will may, does not have to, but may take charge after you die um, and, and do the things that you said to do um, regarding your remains. Or they can decide to not do that, in which case you're back with, you know, it's either the spouse or the next of kin or whatever. And that really helps some people. I know I had someone that talked, you know, at a presentation I did earlier this year who literally said, I don't have any family. I don't have any family, you know, and I want to figure out how to deal with this after I die. You know? So are there, are there people who will file or like deliver things or file things with you to kind of in, with instructions yeah, as to what happens? We can, we can do that. We often do that with people that can come By in. By the way, are you, are you okay? is he okay on camera? That's close enough? Move in a little. All right, how's that? <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, we often have times we have people that come to the funeral home and set up an appointment with us and give us some information just to have on file so when the time comes, um, assuming that they pass away here on the island, all the instructions will be there. And, and by the way, the, 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 the instructions 
need to be, in order for be, to be enforceable or in order to be uh, uh, implementable by your, your personal representative have to be in writing, but they don't have to be in the will. So if by virtue of your now having a will, if you have a will, you've now got somebody who can carry out your instructions as long as they are in writing, okay? Um, now, what about body donations and body part donations and <laughs> tissue donations and all of this stuff, okay? So, I, and, I, and, and Mike, Mike and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, and we said that this doesn't happen a lot here, but let me kind of tell you about this a little bit because this is actually pretty important too. It, um, if, if more if you're concerned about not wanting to donate tissue than if you're concerned about donating. Um, basically, where you're, if, if you, you can make a so-called whole body donation, right, right. to, a, to a, like a college medical, or medical a medical school. To a medical school, right? And that we're not talking about that here. We're talking about the, you know, the thing that you put on your license and if you want to donate, if you want to donate tissue or other things, right? Uh, and, and traditionally, how, the way that worked was that there is a registry and you would sign up for that registry if you wanted a, a donation to be made of your remains to see whether there was something that could be useful to somebody, right? Before the, the, and by the way, the way that happens, it is my understanding, is that in that case, your body, I don't know if it would be different in the vineyard, in, in, where, in other, where, where I usually do presentations in Central Mass, your body actually is sent to the New England Organ Bank, to Waltham. The plate, there really is a place. And, and then they will remove what they need and then send back the rest, send back your remains for embalming or for a funeral or for... Whatever. Is that, is that what happens? Uh, not here. Usually what happens here, if there is a donation or a family request donation, the New England Organ Bank will send a team out here to the vineyard. And they'll either come to the funeral home or uh -huh. they'll come to the hospital and do their um, harvesting, what they refer to as harvesting of organs. So they must they love that, that they actually get a trip to Martha's Vineyard <laughs> to, just, just to kind of look at you. And then they could stay and go to the beach. Or whatever. So they, they, they'll come and then they will so-called har harvest what they That's need. That's the medical term that they use. And, and then and then and then bring it back. Well, I guess the important thing I just want to mention to this about this is, that apparently they weren't getting enough donations. This is the only reason why I can assume this. And so a couple of years ago, this statute was changed. The way this now works is if you die, unless you have in writing specified that you don't want your remains to be, you know, used by it by the New England Organ Bank, it is presumed that it's okay to use them. Yeah, isn't that interesting? But that's number one. So yeah. There is clarification, though. Yep. I believe that the New England Organ Bank talks with your next of kin and your or your spouse and to get permission from them to that to do that. They don't just come and do that without permission. Without permission, except and this is the other interesting piece. Now this is real trivia, and I didn't know this until I was doing this first presentation. You know, that's why I love doing these presentations. Is that it makes me look stuff up. You know, <laughs> that this, according to the statute, the person in charge of your remains, unless you've said otherwise, is your health care proxy. Who would have guessed that, right? That's ahead of your, your spouse and your children is the health care proxy. So if you don't want your remains to be in play, you need to write that, in, put that into a writing. You may want to put it into your health care proxy. If your health care proxy isn't around or you don't have one or whatever, then the next person in charge is the, is the personal representative under the will, and then it's the wife and the children. Who knew? Right? So that's 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 a kind of a brief. And by once, once again, we're glad to answer any questions afterwards. So regarding what happens when they if their body is going to the funeral home and what all of the, how all of that works, can, can you just kind of talk about how that happens? Sure. As far as and and what are all of the things that go into the the disposition of the remains in terms of the funeral home, the services, all of that stuff. And, and can you talk about whether you can do that, figure that out ahead of time? We're going to talk about prepaids later on, but that aside, whether yeah. You can aside do it. from pre, pre, prepaying your funeral, you can certainly pre-plan your funeral. It doesn't have to involve any type of money or anything like that. And you can put your your wishes in place with us or with your next of kin or with your executor, or executrix, or your you know your attorney. Um, and we often have times have families that will come in ahead of time and make some decisions as to what their wishes are to have for services or no services or limited services. Um, and that can be anything from um, donation to a medical school, um, if the person's accepted there, um, to um, basic cremation, to um, a simple graveside service of earth burial, 
um, a traditional service of a visitation at the funeral home or at the church, and then a church service followed by burial or cremation as well. Um, and we often have times have families that come in ahead of time and make those plans and put that in place um, for various reasons. One we'll talk about later with the pre-planning because of state requirements with um, and spend down and things like that. Yeah. But um, more so too because it makes it easier for their next of kin, whether it's their spouse, that, their surviving spouse, or their children, if there's um, more than one child, um, their ideas are expressed and the children have, a, if you will, a road map as to what, what they would like for services. So it, it's very helpful. So now, I had said at the beginning that we were going to take questions as we go along, and I got so excited by the presentation, we didn't do that. So I'm just going to go back quickly. Were there any questions regarding this question of who has control of your remains after you die? Yes, sir. We've just filled up five wishes. It seems to cover a lot of these points of, of your choices. Uh, whether you're cremated, where you're buried, uh, whether you put oil on your body, whether you don't, you know. It, it, it's accepted by in Massachusetts. Uh, we did had it signed at the hospice, as a matter of fact. She doesn't have to do it. Anyone can yep. witness your signature. But there's a whole thing about whether you even want nail polish in a nursing home beforehand and all that. So you're saying that you, that you, that, that you just did a five wishes statement. Right. And that there was a whole section in the five wishes statement dealing with the disposition of your remains after you die. Whether you want to be cremated or not. That's really interesting. I never knew that. I never knew that. Any, any have you seen that? You I've heard prior? of the five wishes and seen it, but I haven't done it. I thought that was care in the nursing home, but I didn't know if it referred to the yeah. I did five wishes. Yeah. Presentation here. Yeah. And it's how we found out about it. <laughs> That's really interesting. Now I know I have I have separate problems with the five wishes, which are just, which we won't go through here, regarding whether their validity while you're still alive, right? But the notion, but, but if it is a writing, then all of that would be binding. Now, when you did that, was there anything in there regarding this question of whether any of your, your remains were, could, were, were to be or could be used or, or donated? You, you could select if you wanted it for organs. It yeah. started out with who your, uh, uh, your what do you call it? Your, your, Gives you who does it for you if you're dead. Mm -hmm. uh, first, second, and third yep. uh, person can be depends upon who's living at the time. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very so. So that is that's interesting. I just haven't seen that. Any other questions or com comments regarding? 